sorry for really come out and continue upon a somber note like this, but feel free to send your condolences to the family. Um, Peter was one of us and, and, a, and a, a soldier in a, this game of reggae and dance hall and just the culture within itself. Um, our next panel is really for the selector, them, which we don't really see much of them there. But there's a lot to discuss where that comes. Sound system culture within itself is really, it, you know, it, it is kind of the, the, the embryo away. Um, street music culture start from. You know, I myself, I was born in Ray Town, and I used to have the Ray Town dance, and um, we are sound system upon the street. Now, we have seen the sound system change in so many ways where selectors now them turn from. One time it was sound system where man a DJ pan man and man a DJ pan rhythm. Till after dub plate come in. Until now, man stop care box and record. Now, them have MP3 and, and you know, it's just the whole thing. So, we're discussing everything from the te technology change in it itself, um, the relevance of it. How much people it reach, you know? Uh, first, from UA, UWI host, uh, Sanja Stanley, Nea. Please come up. She's our, our host. And, of course, Delana from Renaissance. Big selector, you know, big selector. Yo, 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 yo. Seen? Um, oh yeah, they open the second third or so. Let's sit down this And creep chromatic. Everybody know chromatic. <laughs> Josh or Chamberlain, where Josh there? Where there? Come in, Josh. Gabriel Davis, Gabby, come down. And um Pantasan, where there? Bossy. Make some noise, everyone, for a panel. And Sanja, you can start it off. I got us there going, all a vibe. Greetings, everyone. I am Sia Gwan Good, right? No, I'm not convinced. I am Sia Gwan Good. I believe so, absolutely. Now, after what we've been just told, though, I just want to shift the energy to say that Peter is now an ancestor. And I want to say, uh, in my own spiritual tradition, we want to give praises to our ancestors all the time. So, may his soul rest in peace. Jamaica's national instrument is a sound system. We are about to celebrate a century of sound following the innovations of greats like Hedley Jones. In the mid-1940s, following his return from World War II, he was the one responsible for the technology that went into the amplification of sound. Mexico City has some 10,000 sound systems, and Mexico has declared the sound system national heritage. The sound system is big business, and Jamaica's story inside of that innovation is critical. So our panel is going to be looking at the sound system's relevance, impact, reach. And we're going to look at some important things with all of our panelists. And I'm really very happy to be, have been asked to chair this panel by the organizers. I want to big up the three main persons and all the persons who have worked really hard on this music conference. Shaggy, you're a seven-time Grammy nominee, Grammy winner, Mr. Bombastic, working since the early 1990s, Jamaican-American. What role did sound system play in your career progression from amateur to pro? I like that, like I thought, you said a seven-time win. <laughs> <laughs> but we can, we can still, still bat, chew the bat, you know? Yeah. Um, I started on sound system. Like, like I start, my, my, I wouldn't even say at that time it was a career, it was really a hobby. It started on sound system. It started DJ sound, lift box, go out and dance. I think everybody who's a sound man in here can probably attest to the fact that when you're going to the dance, you have a whole heap of people there to help you lift the box. When you're left another night, 
the whole of them gone. <laughs> Cause everybody want to go in at the dance for free, so they might help you lift the box. Right? Specs, you know me at all. Thank God for laptops. Anyway, we get into that. So I, you know, I used to, to, to have, I had my own sound system called Magnax, and then we changed to Crystal, and then after a while, yeah, I used to DJ on a song called Gibraltar, out of Brooklyn. See? The first time I caught the bug of being a DJ artist, one night I go out to skate land, the time I like a picnic, and the thief out and go skate land, and I go watch the time the yellow man are the biggest star in the world. And we used to go to a crossroads, go take bus, even though not, that's not my bus stop, because I would see yellow man walking, I'm yellow sweatsuit. Because it was always a siding. I don't know if anybody is from that time, from my era, them time there, but he had that thing about him where yellow man was a really a people person and just walk, you would see him across road more time. And more time, if you had a little youth, I walk, and you see the yellow BMW come, which he never drive yet, because him didn't have the passenger seat, you always know a yellow man that. I saw him at skate line one night. We waited until late. Him walk in, him take up the mic. Him sing probably about three or four songs and walk out. And the whole dance walk out of him. In at the dance. And I said to myself, I want to be that guy. So it was inspiration for me. And that happened on a sound system. That happened, uh, I think that night, I think I can't remember which sound system. I don't know if it was Lee's, Lee's, uh, Lee's Unlimited that played the night. But it was, it was one of those nights. So sound system to me as a kid was really what, it was really, that was really the CNN of, of the inner city at the time. And uh, I think to today it is still relevant. So let me go to Delano. Renaissance, the first sound to be featured on international stations such as BT, MTV, Apollo, Showtime, and so on, almost 35 years in the business. And from a family in which music was very much present, how did you get involved in the sound system business? Well, I was born into it. My father was an electronic engineer, and he used to build a lot of sound systems. He used to have a sound called um, Plus X from Vineyard Town, and I never used to live with my father. So, but when I started living with my father, one night the guys them on the sound carry me on the road, let them show me how them string up the sound. And when I return home, we get a bus ass. <laughs> the next day my father sell the sound. He get away, he never wanted me to be in the sound system. He wanted me to be in his electronic shop that fix amplifiers. Because I was interested in amplifiers and stuff, because I can't fix amplifiers and stuff like that, I still get involved with the sound music. I used to break dance. I used to do everything to do with music. Um, if I was doing a, my prep school, I would have carried the biggest sound to my class party, to, you know, that it had to go outside to, 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 to entertain the whole school. So after a while, my father realized, all right, all right, we can't stop it no more. Him start help me with the sound system. Say, all right, if you want to amplifier, take that one out of the shop and try to fix it. I couldn't even fix it. <laughs> I have to ask somebody else to help me fix it. So basically, I have a lot of passion for sound system. Um, I grew into it. I know how it, how it started. I know what, the, the, what I have to go through, as, as Shaggy said. I used to have a whole heap of people follow me with the sound. And when the dance done, and me want to lift the box them. Because, yeah, me used to lift speaker box. <laughs> me used to jump on back of the truck. Me used to do everything for sound. So I know about sound system. My father even built Kilimanjaro too. When he used to have the gray box them that year. So I know everything about sound system. So although I might still look like 25, I've <laughs> uh, been through it, I experience it, and I love it. Let me just admit that this is just wicked, though, for me to sit down for an hour to talk to six people, and I want to talk to each of them for an hour. This is, like, really wicked. So, Chromatic. Some people might know your government name. I don't know if you want me to tell them. Warren Lee. Yeah, no Party sound with large followings in the UK, United States, Central America, and more. How did you get started in the sound system business? Well, for me, it was actually from the, mis the mixtape aspect of it. So I uh, was messing around with the home computer, my parents' home computer that they buy for me for the schoolwork. And um, 
I had a next door neighbor who at the time he was big on the mixtape scene. This is within Portmore doses. Um, he actually gave me one of the software programs that he used to make mixtapes, started messing around with it. It was just more so for my friends or just, you know, for the community. And just based off the reception, kept doing it, gotten more and more interested in it. And then that's what really snowballed into me ultimately becoming a DJ. You are coming into the, in the newer age in terms of Somewhat, the technology. Somewhat, yeah. Absolutely. I, 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 I would have said I caught the last part of the mm -hmm. traditional era as far as the record boxes and the CD pouches. For me, when I started, I was working with CD pouches, which it was you know, tedious to some extent. Again, thanks for laptop, but yeah, I, I, I basically would say I, I caught the last part of that era and bridged it over into what it's at now. Okay. So now we want to look at some of the, the ways in which people have, in fact, taken the sound system business and, and made it into a, an educational enterprise. So Joshua Chamberlain completed a PhD at the UWI in cultural studies, and his research was on sound systems. What was the most important finding from your research, Joshua? What would you say? There's, well, there's eight chapters. Hello, check. There's eight chapters, and I think each one of those chapters has something important. But I think the one that I seem to repeat the most is that I think it was in 1973 that uh, Orlando Patterson said that every community in Jamaica should have a sound system. And that, to me, spoke to the reach and relevance of sound system to the communities. And everybody here has actually mentioned the community. So uh, that one seems to stick with me the most, and it's the one that I think you don't really hear about so much anymore. Um, and of course, the educational aspect. One of the, one of the places I went to, to, to learn about their impact on sound system culture was the Alpha Boys School, where Yellow Man went to school, Ilawi went to school, uh, and they had a sound system. Sister Ignatius had a sound, and it was the idea of a sound system as a learning tool at that time. That's something that stuck with me and that the Alpha School of Music um, is, is informed by it today. And we're going to come back to the Alpha School of Music and what exactly is happening there and has happened there to influence Jamaica's sound system business. So Gabby, you are, you've been a DJ. Uh, you, you are a DJ, but you're coming from modeling and reality TV. And you're back in Jamaica from Canada um, where you were immersed yourself in, in the DJ culture. Your aim is to become one of the biggest female DJs in the business. Uh, tell us how you're gonna do that. Hello, okay, just checking if my mic was on. <laughs> um, well, to be honest, as you just covered that, it was more of a transition for me because I was already in the entertainment industry. Um, the plan is to just really embed myself in my Jamaican culture and represent for the women of Jamaica and the women in the industry. I think the industry needs a lot more female DJs. You know, we know what women want. Um, but I just plan to, to, to work on everything out here and get on some maybe like bigger shows, some fests, clubs, things like that. This is the place to say exactly what you want. <laughs> Well, I, I just, um, I kind of want to evolve, you know, in, in a steady pace, on, on a steady pace. So, wherever it takes me. Okay. Pantason, our sixth panelist, the dub plate legend, son of the nine-time world clash champion, Pink Panther, in case you didn't know. Number one dub plate agent in Jamaica. Grammy-nominated recording engineer for DJ Khaled and music producer. How did you get started in the sound system business? Big up God, God above all things. Well, as you say, father, the legend, Pink Panther, my born at Seaview Garden, big up everybody from Seaview. You don't know Seaview, one of the places where the most famous artists them in dance hall come from and sound system also. So my father was around filings and Ricky Trooper in a sea view them days there. 
me used to always go to dance them, teep out and go to dance them, watch him play and them thing there. But most of the time, my family keep the dance them. So after the dance finish, me always take up all of the buckle them in the dance and pull up what the crate. Because each crate full of buckle you carry got the bar, you get to a Heineken or you get to something. So, so me really start and I don't do, because I couldn't make nobody see me in the dance. But I have to wait till the dance done for make it look like a morning. I come take up every buckle. You understand what I say? So being that now, I was always interested in the art of the dub plate, like listening to how creative the dubs were. You see me? That's where my interest lie. It wasn't, although my father was a selector, I wasn't much interested in being a selector. I was more interested in the art of dub plate. So that's how I became a recording engineer, you know, and start being in the studio, creating those dub plates, you know, to, and then listening them back. You understand? And for the people out there listening who don't know what a dub plate is, tell well them. A, well, a dub plate is an artist representing for a DJ in a specific song requested by the DJ. All right. And of course, you have specials. And there's a difference. Yeah, you have specials. Specials are special. songs that are not released. Because, uh, for example, you have song where people do a dub plate where they never release for Spotify. So that's how enough sound system like to have. Because that distinguish them from everybody where make them stand out, make them play something. Because everybody always go in a studio and give one to kill a rhythm and say, kill a DJ, something where nobody not have. You understand? So that's what the EM sound systems always try to have to separate themselves from everybody. Distinctiveness. Yeah. So Shaggy, you, 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 your, your career becomes formed in a moment where the foundation for Jamaican music was, was very much set. And the foundation I'm talking about is the apprenticeship in the business. You, you couldn't just come into music and say you have, well, in those days there was no laptop, but suppose there was a laptop, you have a laptop and you're suddenly um, a, a, a producer or, or anything like that. The foundation was one where you had to work your way into the business and become schooled as you're working your way into aspects of that business. We're seeing a dramatic shift now the, the apprenticeship system is not there no more. What has been the fallout? Well, I put it this way. The sound system itself mm. was really your training ground. It's really how you could, if you use a selector, and any, any of them selector can know that, you know, that when them there in our, ad, in our audience, depending on the time, how much audience, where, what country, who it is, that's when you make your playlist. Sometimes it's on the spot. That's called reading an audience, right? I see selectors who might mash up a dance or so, and they might go to Germany or France or one of them other places there, and they might have change into a, them old playlist, or sometimes them just last and pop down a ground, flat, zero forward. In the dance hall uh, back in the days when you was a DJ, artist with a DJ upon a sound, I could have stereograph, I could have volcano, I could have jarra, I could have whatever, stir Mars, whatever the sound is. You as that artist, as a DJ artist, had to read that audience based on the type of lyrics. So now a selector might be armed with dub plates. We as the artist armed with lyrics. And the lyrics were me I got chat on whichever beat, me have to read the crowd at that point for no one said that tune there. You know what I mean? If, you, if the tune, if the audience in a certain certain vibe, and you come with a slow one drop thing, you might get a flap. Or it might go as far as get a boo. Especially when somebody suck or, or a buckle. Depends on how it go. You know what I mean? So that kind of harsh training ground made you a better artist. Because when you go to overseas now and you start doing your career, you might end up on stage. You got to understand, when you look at some of these big acts in the world right now on stage, they got smoke, they got lights, they got um, pyrotechnics, they got all these things that is making, they got tons of dancers. So they don't have to really feature on their own charisma as much and their most presence. There's so many things that is given to them because they're a big artist, especially those manufactured artists, artists that you know that record labels spend at least five, $10 million on a rollout on one particular song right, and they become massive. And now you see them in an auditorium, in, in, in a coliseum with all these lights, and you say, wow, great shows. And those shows become theatrical. 
it's not really the show that is, that is really interactive with an audience. What the sound system does is teach you to be interactive with your audience. So basically, yesterday, Mr. P. the man can start tapping foot so when the whole sound system, when the whole band broke down, and it just hold the mic and tap him foot and get the crowd, I go, bam, bam, and bust a show. That's what sound system teaches you to do. That is gone. Now, people, you see some man a clash now, and them a clash on dub plate. And you see the dub this. Me guarantee you, if them put them in a forum up a sting, them now nah, go make it pass one line. Because they might wicked pan the dub. And sometimes them dub, you always hear the man them attack. About six man I write them dub there, you know. Them still gonna write up the dub them and rare and them are the you they are DJ it and you perform the the, 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 the the clash lyrics and everything, but I never you come up with it. Both five or six other man help you do it. But when you're on the stage, it's just you and that audience and you and your your opponent. You gotta know how to read that crowd, read that clash, right? And come with that argument on point. That is missing to this day. That is why sound system is important. That's why I don't say they need to come back in the same farm, but there needs to be something to actually do what is known as artist development, right, which is missing in today's day, especially in Jamaica music. And, and, and I want to follow up because I think you are the only one sitting on this panel that I can ask this question. When I think about you, Roy, and the vocal aesthetics that went into that 1960s, late 1960s, 70s time, when him said, we are you to the dance, um, where you to the ball, there is a certain degree of development, even of your vocal style that happens inside of that dance on the sound system live. W w was that something that you benefited Absol from? Absolutely, because you want now. If you're a DJ on a sound system every single night, and let me tell you, you know, the true toll of bunny, you know, the whole I say, your whole style tomorrow, man. <laughs> At that point, you can know now as any trained vocalist, like a Nadim Solalan can say, she can sing from her gut compared to sing from your throat. Right, if you sing from up your soul alone, after a while, after a while you have to know that there are breathing exercises, right, and vocal exercises that people teach in our school now, right, in vocal classes, right, that teach you how to sing and how to project and how to not be hoarse and how to, you know what I mean? On the sound system, you never have nobody that teach you that. That is just raw, you have figured it out. And you have said, you think you, you think you have five man a DJ on a song? If your voice not work tomorrow, man, and you're bad luck, that, because them man, they are shining over you. So you have to make sure you know. So you could have smoke weed, burn cigarette, drink liquor, bam, bam. But after that, a man voice starts sound like Rockstone. Yeah! It's a different sound you have developed. When I was in the military, th them used to have me sing cadences. Some used to sing, I don't know, but I've been told. My CEO wears panty hose. I'm just do them little funny thing there. And then we call me off the front. And I'm running like five miles and singing that at the top of my lungs, right? In the, in the rain with a platoon behind me. And because I sang it and projected it and I had the knack of making up lyrics that was funny, the CEO always calls me out. The drum instructor always calls me out to sing these cadences. And when I'm singing these cadences, I didn't know that was vocal training. Come here, sing from Dunga, so no one I run at the same time. So today, me can do show back to back. Me can do them tours for a long time or what, but that was my training. But I also was on sound system for a long time and DJ, so my voice was, was already developed to the point that when I did it like that, it, it was strong. Thank you for that. Now, Delano, I heard Matterhorn say something in a dance at Bembe Thursdays. I don't know how many of us in here remember. So you did uh, that at Bembe Thursdays? What? <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> Yo! <Yeah>, listen! <laughs> Bembe Thursdays, and um, Matahan says something upon the mic. He said, this, this elector is like a psychologist. And it has stayed with me. I, I, in fact, it's, it's documented in my PhD. And, and, I, and I think to myself, how many DJs nowadays really understand themselves in that way? So tell me about your own role as a DJ now in a dance. You know, are you considering yourself like a psychologist? What are your methods to really move a crowd? Well, maybe I should start from here. 
I actually trained DJs for the ministry. And when it came about, when he sent out the bid and asking people to write, you know, modules and curriculum about training DJs, I didn't want to do it. Because I said, what, is it, what am I going to you know, train DJs about? And um, a friend of mine who's a nurse educator, she overheard and said she wanted to help me. She actually put me through a training. <laughs> we had discussions, we, we talk about it. And then I realized that I'm really a psychologist. <laughs> it's being a DJ, anybody can mix music. You understand? Anybody you can play music from your phone. I see DJs, professional DJs playing at a party and some others come with them phone and mash up the DJ. Cause that person know what the, the audience want, because as they say, you have to read the crowd. So all it is about is soft skills. DJs have to recognize their soft skills. What is soft skills? Soft skills is research. Soft skills is connecting with the crowd. You understand? Soft skill is understanding what you're supposed to understand in your purpose and how you're going to deliver that soft skills. So I was doing this all my life and didn't know because I had to figure it out. That's what Shaggy said. When he's on the sound system, I had to figure it out. When I was coming up, I didn't have no technology, no computer, no nothing telling me that I need to do this and I need to do that. I had to figure it out. How do I scratch? How do I scratch and not annoy the audience? How can I make everything that I do, you know, pleasing to the ears? I had places where I played before and people say, oh, who does the selector there? What am I do? Because I was experimenting. <laughs> I did not accept just watching somebody else playing and follow them. I might get ideas from them and then put it in my own way and deliver it. So for me, I always trying to find ways of connecting with the crowd. Emotion intelligence is the next thing that a lot of people don't understand, which you have to understand people's emotion, understand and then control your emotions to, to actually understand what's com what to come next. So it's all about reading the crowd. So that's what I train in my DJ training. So I, I agree with you. What but matter and say, because if you do something and it don't work, you know, you have to find a way to cut back up. You can't just go, ah. no. I have to find a way to finish on a high. Okay, let me say, yo, you know, sit down and drop down a little bit, but yo, I'm done wicked, yo, play smash up. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a thing where as DJs, we're always learning and, and, and figuring out stuff and stuff like that. I like that. As DJs, we're always learning because I think one of the most important things in life is to, is to recognize yourself always as a student. Yeah. So, Chromatic, how do you prepare yourself? I know you're, you know, you're probably DJ every night. How do you prepare yourself newly, afresh, to go meet a crowd? Especially with what Delana just spoke about, knowing how to read the crowd. How do you prepare yourself? What, 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 what do you take um, as your, your, your most important ways to prepare yourself? Well, I would say by now at this point, being you know, this many years in, you kind of have a feel for the event you're going to be a DJ as soon as you see the flyer, um, just... There's many ways to like figure out what where, where what what kind of setting you're gonna be in even before reaching there. Um, I try to reach a little bit early. Sometimes, if I can, to you know see the crowd, assess them, which demographic it is, what age group. Um, but there's there's so many different ways as far as preparation in the way you probably mean. I just make sure my you know my software is up to date. I have the drivers installed on my computer. That's that's um, something that the software to the hardware, um, and just make sure I have whatever the new tunes are, and yeah, that's really about it as far so as preparation. So that's the technical side, though. Yeah. Let me let me tell you what I mean. I spoke to Rodigan once, and I was asking him, "Is there a method?" 
because I'm, I'm, this is something that I'm critically interested in now, this DJ method. And I'm, it's something I plan to ask all DJs. And what he, his response was related to preparation. Mm. You know, not just the technical side now, but how you prepare yourself. Mentally. Mentally. It's how you, how you, how you, you, you decide that, you know, this crowd is, is a, going to be a particular kind of crowd. And you spoke to some of that, but is there any other way that you prepare yourself? You're doing this day in, day out. It must get, does it get boring? What do you do to, to, to revive yourself? It's, it's more like second nature at this point. It's, it's actually the opposite for me. It's, it's, it's like walking out on a stage, there's no nerves or no, none of that at this point. You get me? I mean, there were days when they used, that used to be the case, but it's just second nature. It's, it's, it's our life. It's what we do. Like, it's whatever you're good at, whatever your purpose is, that, uh, how easy these questions come and how easy it is for you to be who you are. That's how easy it is for us. Like, it's, 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 a, it's a talent that um, it gets better with time. Get better with time. Yeah, so we're, we're always learning. Josh? There, we spoke, we, you, you began to speak about Alpha, the sound system, Sister Ignatius. And I know many persons in here may not be aware of that. Tell us who was Sister Ignatius, the sound system she had, and the kind of influence that that sound system would have had on the many persons who we now know would have been involved and been educated out of Alpha. Of course. I love to talk about the school. I love to talk about the sound, sy about sound system, so you'll have to stop me. But um, Sister Ignatius was the first nun to run the music department at, the Alpha, at the, what was called the Alpha Boys School. Alpha uh, was an orphanage, actually. It started in 1880 uh, by a lady, a Kingston resident named Jessie Rapol. About 10 years later, she needed help. Um, and uh, this was down at 26 South Camp Road where the school is still located. And as I said, after about 10 years, she needed help. The word went out and the Sisters of Mercy from London replied and said, we're gonna send you six sisters. Um, um, and uh, um, from 1890 till now, the Sisters of Mercy have been operating the, the Alpha um, program. And the first Jamaican nun to, to run the music program, which started in 1892, was Sister Ignatius. She was from Mandeville. Uh, so she understood the music, understood the power of music, understood um, the, the, the connections to the community and all of these aspects of music that, that, that the practitioners know. She essentially was a practitioner as a, um, a sound woman, a sound nun for sure. But um, there was a man on campus, a past student named Noel Davy, who had built a sound called Mutt and Jeff. She hired him and he worked on the campus. She hired him for the school events. And he and Leighton Goff were the, actually operated the sound. One was tall, one was short, so they called it Mutt and Jeff, which is a comic strip, uh, still around today. But, the, but uh, Sister Ignatius, he, he decided to get out of it, and Sister Ignatius said, I'll buy it. So she bought Mutt and Jeff and used to hold, set up the sound, string it up on Saturdays for the students. So they would do, and these students were doing music hours and hours and hours. They were instrumentalists for the most part. Um, Johnny Osborne was a drummer. Alawi was a, no, Johnny Osborne was a trumpet player. Um, Alawi was a drummer. Um, and other people who didn't, weren't in the music program, Yellow Man, for example, had a chance to get on the sound. But Yellow Man says it was sister sound. That was the first sound system he DJed on. Um, Alawi says Sister Ignatius taught him to play sound. Um, many other and people. For those who don't know who Alawi is, is there any, I'll give you a prize. Anybody in here who knows who I love is, if you're under 50. I say boom draw up there. Him <laughs> say <laughs> no. Tell us who I love is. Can you give him a mic? <laughs> no microphone in the audience yet? Not yet. Oh my gosh. All right. All right. Curious. We're going to come back to you. We're going to come back to you. Continue. So uh, who it is? Who it is? Selecta Fejalov. Selecta Fejalov. Absolutely. Okay. So it, it had this m huge impact. And those are just the names. Like, there's people who we don't know. Um, but sh I mean, there's people that we can talk to today who, who tell us that she, she used the sound because she wanted them to hear good music. And today we call that listening and appraisal, which is actually a class. 
in formal universities and colleges. So she just knew this instinctively, but that was sound system at the time. It was done instinctively. I think, um, so we fast forward till today, and the Alpha School of Music, which is an associate degree program, said we have to add this. Um, so sound system performance is a required course at the Alpha School of Music for associate degree students. And it's the performance side. There are so many aspects that you could teach that, that should be teached. Mm -hmm. uh, technical side, the, um, the, the, the cables, the building speaker box and things like that. Side. So we'll get there, but, um, and Jamaica will get there too, I have no doubt. But Alpha has been in this for over 100 years, music at least, and sound system is, is very much a part, I think, of what Alpha's impact has been and, and the ability of the school and its students to make connections um, that, that allowed them to go through these experiences, you know, that, that Shaggy and Delano um, and everybody here has mentioned, but they did that uh, on campus. Um, as well as off eventually. Um, but those experiences are critical to the development of the artist. Thank you. Gabby, wh where did your love for music come from? And, and, and tell us a little bit about okay. what has been the major stage that you've played on so far. Okay, so my love of music just, it's just always been, I've just always had a love for music. I've always been inspired um, by people around me. People on the panel like Delano, Creep, Shaggy have definitely fueled my love <laughs> for music. Seeing them perform and being creative is something that inspired me, you know, to branch out on my own and bring my own flavor to the music industry as a female. Um, the biggest stage that I have performed on would have been in Toronto. So I did, um, I've ventured into doing soca music now. Um, I did a festival called Caribana, which is their soca reggae festival in Toronto. Um, apart from that, I did some of the biggest clubs in there. I was blessed to have the opportunity to work with some really talented local DJs in Toronto as well. So, you know, with that being said, it, it gave me the leverage to kind of get to a, a better place or maybe skip a few steps, um, which I'm not really trying to skip any steps, but you know, I had, I had the opportunity to, to really work on some cool things, which has made my resume very long, <laughs> so. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Fantason, where are some of the locations in which you've carried the sound system culture? Well, you know, I have the Juna version of Ping Panther, which is called Panther Sun Movement. You understand? So I've been on tour with Tommy Lee, World Europe Tour, 20 countries in Europe. You understand? I've been to Canada. I've been to most of the Caribbean islands. So, and I have festivals coming up this summer. I have a festival coming up with um, Luciana in Montreal and a next one with um, Barrington Levy in Quebec. So... I've been touring as an uh, artist DJ along with playing music on a sound system. But my, my tours are more likely, it's not the juggling tours, it's more like, like a special appearance. You understand? Like a special appearance, like 15 minutes before an artist performs. That's the type of appearance I do. You know, so I travel around the world. I've been to most of the European countries and understand the different types of juggling set. You understand? Because I've been to even South America, Costa Rica, and these places where 90s dance hall is the prime time of the dance. <laughs> so we are playing 90s in the early part, they might play it in a prime time. And most of the dance hall where we play in Jamaica, they don't even play it over there. So, you know, it, you have to broaden your horizon to music and your approach to music. Because as we say, um, TOK and Buccaneer and General Degree are like Michael Jackson over Costa Rica. So you have to know the music and know say it doesn't revolve around the scene that you're seeing here you know because every territory has their own star and those people they're stuck on like them clocks stuck at the 90s and them refuse for moving so no matter where you tell them say a 90s dance all them say over them side of the world so you have to know how, how to adjust and don't be like a one-sided DJ where you just tell yourself say yo them sang your hat and make a play them because no you have to know how to adjust you have people in Europe that nobody knows about in Jamaica that when you go to Europe, you have to find them, download them song, and play it in the dance. 
So you have his ability to adjust while touring also. So it's not about just playing everywhere and you know, it's a same as Creep says, it's a learning process. Everywhere you go, every country you go, you learn about a new artist, you learn about a new song. So it's it's ability to adjust anywhere you go in the world. Boy, oh boy. I mean, maybe we would send 90s dance hall. We're stuck in that mode in Jamaica too, right? But I don't want to get myself in a trouble right now. <laughs> so I'm going to leave that alone for the minute. I want to just follow up with you though. Like, what would you say has been your biggest achievement in the sound system business thus far? Well, my biggest achievement is playing on the same event with my father in Canada. When you can know, say, your, your, your generation and your father's generation will be seen on the same level and booked for the same event. You know, that's my biggest achievement because my father is my idol. You know, I do this for him, you know, and I don't care about nobody else. That deserves a clap for true. <laughs> <laughs> so before I shift into some conversation about the structure, the enabling environment, the kinds of things we want to do policy-wise, I want to ask you, Shaggy, if you could tell the youth today something about the foundation of the music with sound systems that helped you major help and by which they could be helped, what would that be? You mean in specific things that has happened to me or just in general? Specific things specific. that have happened to you. Well, for me, I remember the first time. when There's a song called Big Up, Big Up, which is a massive, massive hit for me. But that, those songs, Big Up and another song called Mampe, were massive hits in New York, tri-state area. In, in Miami, um, but none of those songs were released in Jamaica. We didn't have distribution. And at that point, we are putting them out on a little label named Signet in a New York at the time, me and Sting International, and we put those records out. We, it, the two major distribution in Jamaica was Sonic Sound and Dynamic Sounds. So we never put our records through them. We just didn't know them. We didn't know who them was, because my thing really happened out in New York City. And those songs were massive, 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 massive. So I remember one time there was a clash between Addis and Stone Love. And we get a call, say, Rory from Stone Love want to come down at the studio. When we got a studio, it was all New York artists. It was me, Red Fox, Screechy Dan, Badger Jed, Nike Fungus. You know, ev uh, every New York artist you know that had these big records was who um raw advice and it was a unique strategy because at that point the man and we are both the biggest though play them are, are like them up wolf a bounty killer wolf a butcher and you know what i said and and rory just came in read the temperature of the city at that point and decided that he's going to voice all of the new york artists and at the night when the clash are gone and others load up with a holy pa bounty killer and holy pa butcher and re, re, re. Rory come with a tune in him, oh Carolina. And he say, hey, thinking sound boy, you're a boy. Go wash your granny red. <laughs> and mash up. And the place just turn over. And then play a big eye of a pack up, pack up. Idiot sound boy, pack up. And the place just proper, proper, proper shell, 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 shell. And it was an upset because Addis at that time had the biggest, biggest thing. So all of coming, but the man him take a whole different strategy. Where at that time, Addis, you know, the trend was really for us to play all of the other artists in front of So we did, but we had a boss the place. And we have all of them, them song there. What Rory did was further on, he came to Jamaica and it was at House of Leo. And decided, said, them tune they went play and bust up the place in New York. He might go dry it at Jamaica House of Leo. And the man draw oh Carolina and shell down in there. Right? And from that point, that's how people start to get involved with Shaggy. He also did it when we did it, Bedwalk Sensation. Because we did it uh, bed, oh, upon the Boombastic beat, we did do another song for, for Merciless, bed, Bedwalk Sensation. We did produce, we did put out a tune there, upon Big Yard at the time. And he was the man with the draw them tune and draw Boombastic right after Bedwalk Sensation with Merciless. And them tune had become big. So that was kind of introducing Shaggy. Seeing as a as a as a new artist and a brand and them tune that that became in, ended up becoming big massive international songs, but Rory kind of figured it out from before. That's just him re re reading the room again and reading 
um, the city at the time to bring it in. So to me, the sound system was very, very important at that point to bring us legitimacy. You know what I mean? And 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 um, it was really great. So I think it, which leads me to another point. I'm not really want going, at, but it, it, you know, it is a dying breed at this point, and you know, we want to basically protect that as it is because the other day I a, a, a thing where uh, mighty crown them said them had a farewell, fear, farewell, farewell clash, farewell tour. I mean, oh mighty crown for farewell. So yeah, them said that the, the culture where them build them whole empire upon dead. To me, we just couldn't, so we couldn't endorse it, in other sense, big up mighty crow, but we just can't endorse it, because to me, it's not a, a, it's not a thing we can die, because it is still so needed. I think you it's them mean? putting down the, the records, though, you that feel they were deciding that they weren't going to tour our Yeah, or but I don't anymore. think, you think of marketing? Come here, say, what am I going to put on, what am I put on something to make them so much? Unless they feel like it now, make them so much. I mean, if you know better than me, make me know. Come in, if you talk to Chin, they're still touring, right? I don't no, know. No, I, it's the farewell no, tour done. No, no, yeah, I don't think they're still touring right that now. That was the last show. show. Unless they're my plan for doing another farewell. <laughs> Trust me. We shall, we shall have to consult with them on this matter. So, um, Delano, sound system culture is not just about sound. It's the the wider culture is embedded in fashion unique forms of ad uh, adornment, there's dance, language, and, and so much more. What is your thought, this is trouble now, may I try to get you, you know. What is your thought of the strictures in place around the use of profanity? I mean, there's a time and place for everything. I mean, <laughs> profanity, I mean, well, Jamaican Badwood is one of the biggest thing across the world. If there is indeed a bumblecloud <laughs> festival. R okay, thank you, you said the word. <laughs> But I can go if them lock you up. Me go say me don't know you. Me go say me. No, me go say it wasn't me. <laughs> well, I mean, going to all these different countries all over the world that don't even speak English. But once I walk out on the stage and I say Bumba Cloud, the place mash up. I don't even have to play the first song. <laughs> you understand? So it just depends. Cause some people don't even take it as a bad word. You understand? But in terms of profanity, yes, you have. If, if it's an adult event, I don't think it should be a problem, right? So if you're, if you're doing an event that involves kids, then I have a problem with that. You understand? So there's a place and time for everything. So probing the same question, though, if chromatic, if you're in an event, clearly Jamaican music has some, uh, you know, sort of it's the, the culture of profanity is, is there. We can't get away from it. But how do we manage the aggression, though? Because a lot of the times, the music is aggressive. And the music will cause those persons either in the event or playing, suppose a clash, to get aggressive. How, 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 how do we manage this aggression? I think it's just about being professional is that what we do, which I would hope that we all are at this level and conducting yourself in the respective manner. But, uh, well, from a DJ standpoint, in my case, it, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm mindful of obviously having edited versions to the songs that needs be, you know, having it, but it's, uh, it would probably fall more on the MC in, in many of these cases because in some cases when I get booked for an event they say no profanity they're really actually speaking on the MC not you know overdoing the profanity or um, just respecting all, all groups of peoples you know um, so for me I don't really get booked for too many events where I have to play edited music um, my managers are mindful of of that because it for, for me for some songs it takes away you know but uh, time and place as the learner said time and place you just have to be mindful and you know be a professional so the highest form of commercialization that we have seen in the sound business so far was attempted by red bull and i stand to be corrected if anybody has any other example they had these culture clashes which they toured on several 
continent, Jamaica was actually the last stop. Oh, no, remember that? Yeah, last stop. No, 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 in other words, they, they, they're, well, okay, so Jamaica, the, the, the last stop Jamaica was a few years ago. What more do we need? Because this was external validation in a sense. We don't have any big commercial push behind sound system. So that Red Bull culture clash would have been external validation again for our culture. What more do we need to do to secure and at this point expand sound business in Jamaica? That's anybody on the panel. Well, check, check, check. Sound system culture is not respected in Jamaica. That's the first thing. Um, there's no, yep. there's nobody, right, thank you. There's nobody, all right, everybody was blaming the government, right? But there's nobody to educate the government about sound system culture. There's nobody to petition the government at the same time. Yes. You know I mean? We have to organize ourselves. We have to organize ourselves. Organize ourselves. We have to organize ourselves. We have to get, you know, and, and petitions and stuff like that to basically get the government to go. You know, you have Minister Grange, but she cannot go do so much if she don't have numbers to prove to them. Say, oh, you're right. right. This and this are go on. So that definitely is a, a, a part of it. And, and the thing about it is ego too, because you have so much sound system. And we try many times to get, get sound system together. Because sound system bigger out of Jamaica. You understand? And a lot of people don't understand why we had sound system in the first place. And tell me if I'm wrong. Um, when back in the days, they used to produce Jamaicans producing Jamaican music. The radio station wasn't playing no Jamaican music. All they were playing was foreign music. So how them going to get people to hear the music that they were producing? They build sound system and play it in the streets so they could have promote their songs. So it always have always been getting a fight. So basically, the sound system needs that kind of, as you said, to come together and fight for the sound system so it can be bigger. Because sound system, when it's a song, like they said, reggae and dancehall created hip-hop. I think that's that's a different kind of thing. It's really sound system culture. Yes. Created yes. hip hop. Yes. yes. Right. So Correct. there's a yes. lot of messages out big, there. That's big up, big up, yes. Right. Big up so for that. that's why I'm saying to you that how we come together now and make people know what is sound system culture. How we're gonna do it. Man like Shaggy keeping all these kind of this com conference, letting us know our people can understand what is happening in terms of our culture. The Red Bull culture. Trust me, it's one of the biggest things. Respect it to the, to the ground. First time I see it, and then it come to Jamaica, and it get the support. But when um, a panther sound and, I mean, Pink Panther and the Kilimanjaro and whatever, they don't get that kind of crowd. They don't get that kind of support. So Jamaicans and a whole still don't respect the sound system culture. Now it is not just, it's, it, it's a whole thing behind it. But yet still, when a foreigner do it, it big. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? One, one other thing, too, is, is we can sit down here. When you talk about the nice abatement, right? <laughs> That's another <laughs> live life. So, to me, because we're a cultural hub and we are the symbol of culture throughout the Caribbean, I just think there should be a certain amount of leeway. Now, again, this might take organization, this might take you know, us going together. But remember, I did deliver the. Um, Albemarle E17 around the sound. They used to have a train track around behind the, behind the building. Y you know what I'm talking about? So when the train run here, it goes and that run all kind of night. So the first time you go in there, so forgot to get the apartment now, you said, you know, that train is yo. I stay up all night, me, this is something around behind me. That, yo. But you want now, the apartment, I go for a good amount of money. I said, you know, you know so I take it. I'm going to tell you, say, you're dead for a while. I don't even feel the damn train up for us, yo. That is sound system culture to me in Jamaica. Me raised with my window, the machine at night time. Right from my little boy till now. So I understand how some people make it look like, oh my lord, my window is shaking and I cannot <laughs> sleep. How much I want to sleep with the TV on? Like the TV now make nice here. Yeah. No for them do it. So to me, it's just hypocrisy at the end of the day. They must sit down with this thing about, oh, yo, yo, it is bothering my neighborhood. And blah, blah, blah. Me living in a nice neighborhood, and more time I hear it, I just saw it go. A part, a part of where we grew up on. To me, that is culture. I just saw it go. It now stopped me from sleep. May I sleep through it? 
So, the, so there's a dimension of this conversation that takes us into the enabling environment, the kind of infrastructure that is needed, and some of the responsibility rests on government in terms of facilitating that. And so you would have heard conversations about developing entertainment zones, for example. You know, why it is we can't have certain zones that you can go and play morning till night. And then, of course, not to bring this in really, because it's another troublesome topic, is why does carnival get treated a certain way and dance hall and social system culture not the same way? But, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Is there anybody else on the panel who wants to respond? <laughs> yeah, we have to respond to that because... <laughs> We are support dance hall, dance hall play 90% of the time in Trinidad. Only time soccer play at Trinidad. 99%. 99. Only time soccer play at Trinidad is during carnival. After that, a beer dance hall. So, oh, we are support a culture where support we more than themselves. Because them, them support dance hall more than soccer over there. You know. As much as they facilitate, facilitate their um, carnival, when Carnival done the selected the machine that glad for pay dance hall. Them glad more dance hall events keep in Trinidad than soccer. You understand? More Jamaican artists perform in Trinidad more than oh, Trinidad artists perform at Jamaica. And we are endorsed the soccer culture so hard. And them take dance hall and hug it up so. You have a festival in Trinidad called Great Fet. Every time an artist is booked, it keeps Saturday night. You know when the artists perform 8 a.m. Sunday morning? Breakfast time. And the event done 10 a.m. So dance hall events are finishing at 10 a.m. the following day in Trinidad. And dance hall events at Jamaica can't pass 2 o'clock. You're lucky if I get 2 o'clock. Uh, yeah. Even last night, them try TJ, TJ's yes. performing. You see it? At, by the <laughs> campus. Police oh, come TJ. 1 o'clock, mm -hmm. fill off TJ performance. 1 o'clock. Yeah. On a Saturday night. On a Saturday <laughs> Not night. Not a Sunday night. So I want to go back to what Delano said, though. There's something that we are not doing here to promote, to preserve, to, to, to really love our own culture. Why we are in this place? Because yeah, everybody else, Kingston is the noisiest city on the planet. People know us for noise. What I call sound, because noise to me is a pejorative word. It's not noise when it's not money. It's business <laughs> be behind the, the noise, right? Yeah. There's something that we are not doing. Well, it starts from how long now? <coughs> start how long now, right? In terms of reggae music and dancehall music and sound system was always associated with something bad. Either drugs, murder, whatever it is. So that stereotype still carried up to this day. You understand? Because if you wasn't selling drugs, you couldn't afford a sound. That's how me go up and see it. Because reggae music never used to play in certain people's household. You understand? Because I had family like that. Because I, I was the bad one out of the crew. Because me, 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 I play everything. <laughs> me, I play dance hall. What's that? The, Junior, what's that you're playing? You understand? But Calypso play though. In yeah, her, yeah, Calypso play and, <laughs> and, and Frank Sinatra and Frank all those Sinatra, things. And, yeah. And yeah, Country I, I music. Mean, <laughs> I, I have so much of those albums from my father days, but I'm saying to I couldn't really play dance all inside. He couldn't even play Bob Marley. Remember? So all of that is coming. So people have understand it coming from back then. Colonialism. How, how, yeah, right. So how do you change that now? So now when you talk to some police, the first thing them look at you like, oh, you're coming with those boogie-aga music now, boogie-aga this and boogie-aga that. So it's, it's all cemented in them head from ever since. So how do you, you know, how can we convince them now that this is the, this, yo, our culture start a whole heap of the genres, or me playing at dance hall festivals, other parts of the world, and me are going at, as him said, 10 o'clock in the morning, and this thing, we can't do it at Jamaica. You know, right? I know you won't come in, Shaggy, but just let me qualify what you've just said a while ago. Jamaica is credited with, if depending on who you speak to, indigenous musical genres, at least seven of them, eight, depending on who you're speaking to. And I've mapped already about 64, at least, that we have influenced just in the latter half of the 20th century. And this is, this is real sound innovation now. Because Jamaican music, no musical genre since the 1960s has escaped influence from Jamaican music. 
and the, the number of genres of music developed in Jamaica, we, we, we have to go back to sound system culture to understand the kind of innovation in terms of that music. And, and, and we don't know that. So there's a role for conferences such as IMC, for global reggae conferences at the University of the West Indies, for institutions like Alpha, to be able to educate people about the music. It's not just about a song and a dance. Shaggy. Yes. You want to say something from no, long time? No, no, no. Let me just up. Before we go to questions. Yeah, reiterate with, with, with Ima say, right? And we should really look at the value of what it is as a, as a culture. And just like you say, you make some, some incredible points. You know, even when you say that, you know, hip hop, which, you know, has garnered probably over some 10 billion years, you know, I mean, within that one particular genre, which no other genre has really done that within a short space of time, within a 20 year span. You know, what I mean, it really came from sound system culture. I don't think the powers that be, because of quote unquote colonialism style of thinking back in other days, right? I still don't think that the powers that be here really look at dance hall or sound system culture. Right, uh, with that respect, still to this day, they, they still look at it as you would say boogie yaga music because they might come from that same area, you know. See, so anyway, Q and A, are they so there? Q and A. Yeah. Well, we have one minute and nineteen seconds and counting. Any question? Who have the mic? Hand up in Put up your hands so we can see if you have Specs any questions. The bars in the front, also too. This has yeah. been a really interesting conversation. Yeah, there are some things up, that we have to do. Turn on the mic, the fair. Question, question. question. Hi, hi guys. My yes. name is Deja. I'm an artist, like most of you guys. I have a question for the whole panel. Um, historically, radio used to break records until maybe the 80s and the 90s, where sound systems and spinning records became a mainstream thing, with mainly remixing records, which created two new genres, house and hip hop, like you guys talked about right here. So I want to know, why is it that the culture no longer leaves itself open to finding new talent and breaking new records, thus closing off one of the channels by which groundbreaking and pioneering, pioneering musical works would come to be. I just want to know why is it that we're not as DJs, like being groundbreaking and pioneering anymore, or working with new talent and new artists to find the next thing that's coming out to make the culture great, if you understand me. I think there's a lot of that being done, love. Well, I, 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 I think, would beg I to think differ. I, from when, when, when we listen to a song, we go, we go uh, up to a Monday, said that day, we go up a new tune, the man I'm dry now. We go up a new, 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 go on again. Yeah, I do disco, I do pop, right? I'm yeah. also, I mean, I know Sharon Burke, I know a lot of people here. Yeah. And I've kind of been in the background watching the whole thing play out, and I've noticed that usually it's either the people with the links or the artists who are already somewhat um, made that get their songs played. And I'm, I'm not here to pop my collar, I don't want to do that. But I'm saying there are people like me out here, we're doing, we're doing different type of music, and I truly believe in what I'm doing. I know yeah. other people believe in what they're doing, and I think it can be groundbreaking if people on the panel would give us a chance and listen to us and really see, hmm, yeah, it's different, but uh, it can do something. All right, so you were just saying a while. You were you just saying a while. Yeah. You said the people then with the links, right? Yeah. You're in the place where the links are. It's your job to make the link, darling. It's your job to make the link. It's your job to be in people's faces. These people that you see up here that are doing it and getting that shine, yeah. it's because they're doing that legwork. You That's don't true. know the amount of people come to me within this thing when I have a fan of I say, brother, I can't do it right now. And I'm going to shoot something at me. I say, yo, true. brother, you have to listen to this now. Where your email, where your this. That's you doing your legwork yeah. to get your. And if it's, you got to understand, if you come up with a type of music, he going to play music we have a feed for him family. So true. if you come yeah. with a country and western record for go play in the middle of the night because you are experiment. And him a play in a dance hall setting. You can't marry for early one you get, you know. You, you understand me? I said, me like it, so I go play it now the early one. Him now go play it now in prime time because when that man come over here, so I come mash him up, and him I get the food, and him not go home with nothing. Well, well, yes, but we, they are breaking it. You now have to alter your music and, and create what is known as a hybrid. Uh, no, no, you can't mix it up. 
No, Hear yeah, it up. Yeah, let, me, let me answer the question. It's not every selector or sound system can break every music. Yes. Right? Hold on. We're in a different time now where you have millions of selectors playing music right about now. And one party. And each of them get 15 minutes, 30 minutes. They're not going to experiment. Sorry. They're not going to okay. experiment with music. They will, they will do research. Some of them will do research and say, you know what? I like that song here. I'm going to try to remix it so it can play with a hot song there. Radio stations supposed to be the, the ones that break in songs. Uh, right? And that not happen either. But it's a different... Yeah, but you see what I'm saying to you? That DJs... It's, and it's not every DJ can break a song. So it's, as, it's, as Shadi said, you have to do the legwork until you find that right DJ, Dela. that right selector to break your type of song. That's how I look at it because I've been doing it for years. It's me why... Business signal about we break business signal, we break Vegas. Dirty Cup crew up to Sean Paul is Renaissance first. Right? In terms of so we do, I know I do the legwork. I, I I did I, I did I did my work, but there's not there's so much wait, you all have no sound system, it's pure selected about. Right? And they're going to play their 15 minutes of fame. Uh, Simple. And, but so, you know, so, so, so maybe something can help you too. Just go help me I try to help you at the same time. Okay. See? Is is if if you're coming with a different style of music where, where you find hard for break in at this arena, because it's, a, it's mainly a dance hall arena, you kind of, because I have the same thing. I make music, this is hybrid music. I'm sometimes able to come some weird, weird things. I'm going to say, I wish I could come with this. But me, I have a little bit of a, of a platform because I have a brand. But imagine when me, they just start, and I'm going to say, I can't water down R&B something this is the brother I come with. You understand what I said? So for you, what, what I did was find some other avenues to do, to, to do it. So... I would create a buzz elsewhere. See, I did a lot of television at that time where they might say, yo, I would have brother, but I like a red brother, I sing one something here. And you create a buzz. So you, maybe you could take that other direction by, by literally creating something maybe on social media to create the buzz to, that make them go ahead and try to do it. Sorry. Um, next question. Oh, um, I was just Sorry. adding to what you were saying by answering her question because my suggestion to you would be to develop your marketing. You know, maybe you can create a, a blast where you find different DJs' emails and you send out your music. You have to make sure that your social media is on point so that your image is out there, your sound <coughs> is out there. You can't just depend on the DJs creating that for you. So that's my only Use thing. Hashtag. Yeah. Use hashtag. If you do house music, search hashtag house music DJs. Hashtag is how you find niche. That's how you, everybody That's how is gonna... grouped. Hashtags. Yeah. Yeah. Specs. Yeah. So you know, last question. Yeah. All right. So Specs. what I was going to say, you were talking about the important. Well, first of all, I want to send a big shout out going out to Kenny McIntyre. You know, he's the one that, you know, developed the Red Bull sound clash okay. thing there and brought the sound clash system into the corporate world. So big up to him and uh, yeah. All right, so on the importance of uh, the artist them and, and sound system culture, it was very important for the artist them, I think for me, because um, it taught the, the artist them, especially when doing dub plates, how to do the voice projection. When it was dub plates back in the day, it was on steel. It was one lick on the dead pan plastic. You can afford to make a, a mistake. So that helped with the performances and all that too. Also, with sound system culture, teaching, well, coming from where I came from with 45s, I learned about the artist them, you know, the name of the rhythm, you know, the, where the place was that they voiced the song and all these things. So when it came to uh, sound system culture, if I didn't know how to find an artist or whatever the case is, I would know the address from the label and I would just go to the studio where, and, and do my work there. Um, so just the importance of sound system culture, I just thought I'd point out. And uh, Shaggy, I just wanted to correct you. The Baja Jed, that was on the Old Carolina rhythm. Mavis was on the Bombastic rhythm. Oh, that's what I said? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's from learning oh, from oh. the labels and sound system culture once yeah. again, too. It's really sad because it, it's we it, put them it, June it out. Like <laughs> <laughs> when you put some of songs out, you know, you, you kind of think. <laughs> what can we say? One, one more question, if you don't mind, Shaggy. As I'm a Sam White killer, White Cliff killer. Pop, 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 pop. The man, Duppy. I've seen him dead. I want that Duppy one. to my name. Oh, I got one Duppy to my name, and it's a big Duppy. <laughs> but hear what now? Based off of what you said, Shaggy, that you gave Rory and Stone Love some dubs, yeah? And it helped bust Old Carolina and other songs. 
And then hearing the conversation about uh, um, the government not helping sound systems and everything like that, I want to just try and mix it up a little piece. Knowing how important sound clash culture is to sound systems, and now knowing the price, Pantasun, of dub plates, do you not feel that the dub plate prices right now is helping to kill sound clash culture? Because if you think about the price of a dub plate right now, but averagely it's like what, four or five hundred dollars? But what is the average <laughs> price a sound system is getting paid to play out? How many dubs can you buy based on your income as a sound, si sound Before system? Before you answer that, how much free dub you get from? No, no, no. <laughs> and, uh, you get, I get holy per free. I do. I do. I do get holy per free dubs. I do get holy per free dubs. You're but asking for your friends. I'm uh, no. I'm asking for the community okay. of okay. sound systems because I love sound clash culture. But knowing that these sounds can't get to play a barrage, a alkaline, a barrage, a pop can't. The prices are escalated and going through the roof. And I think that is helping to kill sound clash culture. So I put that question to you, Panta. And I also Panta. put that question to Shaggy, who I know is not cheap for dub plates as well. <laughs> Panta? I lost three dubs that ever get counted. <laughs> yo, yo, yo. You're wicked, e man. Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> Spec says, send them to me. <laughs> yo. All right. I agree with you. The prices I get outrageous. And the reason being, like, uh, it's, it's, it's a cultural thing because, you see, this new generation of artists, their dependency on DJs to bust their music is less. So, them respect and them, like I say, homage when them have to pay to the DJ, them, them don't really feel them have a friend, no man. You understand what I say? Because the internet bust them song. And most of them bust so, from so you don't think that is a wrong move? No, it's a wrong move, but okay, it's human right, nature. Exactly. But may I explain? Because you have to explain why they, they are like this. You know? So it's human nature because a man say, yo, me never depend upon a selector for bust of a song. And the internet bust it. Me never got a road girl thing there. So if a man from the road call me and want me to be my pay with my money. I saw them, that's the mentality they have. But secondly, hold on there. Secondly now, you see, it has to do with ego at the same time. Remember, I said, dub plate is the first money an artist see before he even start get booked for a show. You understand? So some of them see it as like, they might try to make the most out of dub plate. I try to buy house and car and land, pay five girl rent. So it's, it's a thing where, it's a thing where, they might try to milk it when they don't feel milk it. They use it as a marketing strategy. Same as Oshagi say, you know, give a whole DJs, free dubs. As we say, it has to do with, with, with them themselves. You understand? And where them have to go to to reach where them there. So sometimes cer certain people attitude and, and them outlook upon the business, you can't really blame them because they don't know how them upcoming and where them have to go to to reach where them reach. So everybody has their own. The selector has their own cry where them say the price is outrageous. It's a man like me you now where they're upon both sides and understand the business because I'm a selector and I'm a double agent. I mean, if you talk to them and say, listen, it is a man cannot play, pay $500 for a dub and, and, a, and a $300 he might get paid for the dance. You understand? So I've been, I've been lobbying for this. Me even put out a newspaper article. It's even on my website, pantason.com. Pantason said the price is a dub play too expensive. So I'm doing my part in influencing this new generation. But you must understand where they're coming from. So they, it doesn't make them a bad person. It's just that them struggle when they have to come up. You understand? It's not the traditional way where the selector, they just give them a strength and them and they give them a strength. Them vice a song in them house, they put it on YouTube, it get popular, and then the selector boss it. You understand? Because as we say, music come out of the hands of the radio and the DJs are gone to the internet. So everybody feel like them is a label. You realize the artist no longer a link producer of a produce song no more. Every man just want to download a rhythm off of YouTube, vice it, and put it out because one RPM easy to put up song. You know, everybody is becoming an independent person. So it's the independence in the business. That's part, of the, prob artists. That's part, part of, the of the problem, problem too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. everybody feel like they can do not everything. Not everybody is a producer, you know. And everybody is a producer, but one of them <laughs> feel like they can do everything. Yeah. Well, let me, so know, let me know when the record will go far. So <laughs> is, 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 is that really a mess of the business? It's because them outlook on it. Because them say, yo, it's easy for me to find a song. It's easy for me to do this. So they, they don't feel like they need people. So Sean B, we're going to ask Panta as the president of the Dub Plate Association to take your, your, your concerns yeah, to the yeah, community. Yeah, they're lobby feed. They're lobby feed. Continue but to take your concerns to the community. Hold on, we only have yeah. two minutes left. 
And I want us, if there is only one burning one. question left from the audience, who has the microphone, before I ask each panelist to tell us their final words. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marvin Anderson, and I was a part of the songwriters uh, workshop for the last two days. It was a very, very good experience. Shaggy, thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mikey Bennett. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Good stuff. Um, the, as far as the uh, sound clash culture goes, I believe artists have to not be so greedy. Back in the days when sound clashes were going on, artists were lined up to just get on the mic with any rhythm that go and spit the lyrics. And that's why the sound clash was going. If today it was that to happen, the sound clash will come back because if Panta string up and playing in uh, Christiana and Joshi gonna come through, Alkaline coming through, Idonia coming through for free, everybody's gonna be there. Yeah, but that still happened. No. That, that, yeah, me say that happened. Me people string up and man and man come in, come. Yeah, yeah so that, that, that happened, you know what I mean? No, no. no it's happened already. People, they still, the man and man run up and it depends on if it's a, is, is a, a notable sound. The man and run up with the mic, but new artists do that. Sometimes big artists do that. You know what I mean? So it, it still happens. I just think at this point, for make it become a big, a bigger thing, certain, certain things have, have to change. The culture, it's, it has to become cool again. It has to become cool. Yes. Right? You need a cool factor to bring, to come back to, 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 to um, sound system um, thing. And, and, you know, I've been talking to, to even Chin about some, some other ideas, because I have a whole lot of ideas which may not disclose but how we could do that. But me and Chin did have a little conversation there. But there's something I would want to touch upon, the thing where you show me today. Yeah. I want to ask, ask Shani B. Shani B. Know, no, no, no. You, you know about that? That's something where you have to pay a license? DJ's license. DJ license. The DJ license. Yeah, so, but, but them sell something international, they are England. They know England they come from. So you're not paying a license? So are you telling me it's BS? So, so you are I it. did So you have your license? Uh, or you mean you're not? Yeah, we know about yeah, that. I understand the venues. Uh, yeah. So met the DJ. So is it something that is true where DJs are now going to have to play license to play a party? Yeah, but them, but them, link, them link you with all. Yeah, every time something comes, them link me. They know the, ri <laughs> them know the rich I, people. Them. I, I, did, I, I disagree I with the rich people. Them. I did verify with one of our collecting rights organizations in Jamaica. And yes, DJs are required to take out a license because of the copying of the music. We, we so, understand. yes, promoters and venues and so What do you mean copying? Because... If you have three DJs, if you have three selectors sharing a hard drive, oh, sharing. Oh, copying okay. the music to be able to distribute to different selectors in a particular conglomerate. So Renaissance, for example, you have four or five, six selectors, you're sharing the music. And so there's that requirement. But we're going to educate ourselves a little bit more about compliance. Yeah, I disagree with about this, No, 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 no. Well, it's not for disagreement. It's something <laughs> in the regulation right now. So we just have to educate ourselves about it and to be able to have Jamaica be one of the most compliant in terms of the music business, and that's one of the areas that we're weak on. Last right. words, future of sound system. I want to take your cool factor as your last word, Shaggy. Last words, <laughs> sound system business in the future. Where are we going? As you say, it's a cool factor. We have to, um, it seems like it's old school. Clashing seems like it's old school for old sound and all this. So how are you going to make it feel young again? Well, you clearly see when I tell when, 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 um, Wycliffe yeah. um, go up against the big bad general way right. <laughs> and, and all the players rip up right. and, and that was the old school because there were all ages in, inside us all so, yeah. but the next thing though in terms of the, the, the dog plates and uh, expensive dog plates that's been going on a long time so it's not new artists that's why I had to come up with remixes I had to innovate myself we started the remix crazes in Jamaica I couldn't have four dog plates that then Trying to be star remix though. So it's not just expensive dub plates. It's not a man stringing up on the side of the road and DJing on the sound. It's just that it's not cool anymore. That's all it is. Chromatic. Last words. Where's the sound system business going? I mean, I, I've always noticed over the latter years that there's, there's been less sound systems being. It's, it's really not cool for the for the newcomers into the business, they'd rather be a solar DJ, solar MC, and freelance. You can 
do any any event with any DJ. It's it's actually probably more profitable for them at this point. Um, where 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 it's going, there's no telling. But hopefully, it's not you know a, a dying issue. You know. Josh. Well, um, I think sh in short, use it or lose it. Um, <laughs> give the next, give the youth the, the the tools. Let them decide where it goes. But I think you have to give it to them first. Right now, it's very hard to find a sound system, let alone work on one. So um, luckily, students at Alpha have the opportunity. But what is an equalizer? What, 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 where does this go? Those types of things. Give them a chance, and they'll decide. They'll lead us. Gabby? Um, well, my only note to that is my hopes for where it's going is to bring back music that is not just trending, but longevity. I guess the reference would be the 90s, you know, to try and bring that back. So that's my two cents. Panto? Well, I see sound system going more digital. I see DJs have more online shows than physical parties. So that's the trend that I see going on. And I see it's expanding based on this whole blockchain and, you know, um, everybody having their own NFT. I see DJs making digital NFTs of themselves and playing in the metaverse. You understand? So that's where I see it going. Because as I said, Black Eyed Peas had a concert in the metaverse. You understand? So that was a test of showing how, you know, DJs can make a version of themselves. So even our veteran DJs like um, King Jammies and Black Scorpion, them, can also make a digital version of themselves and create a set of them, like make a whole set, like a series, like we either watch on Netflix, you know, and make a digital version and still have their relevance in this age. It watch in a real time? It happened in a real time? Like when you watch it? When I watch it, it no, it, man, yeah. they, they actually record it and, and oh, make an animated it version. I mean, I'm I'm saying if, it, if it go in a real time, I mean, yeah, where you can probably, I mean, no, put, watch it on your device or put on your goggles or whatever, and you're inside of the dance inside, in yeah, real yeah. time. Yeah, that'd be wicked. At least somebody yeah, now get shot. Yeah, yeah, that's that's where I see it going. <laughs> it's, I see it going more digital based on, on, on the technology. Yeah. So I see sound system DJs, you know, you have to adapt, as we say, you have to adapt. You see these things going on, more DJs going on TikTok and making more money than they ever make oh, playing oh, anywhere. Oh, oh. How you feel about AI dubs? AI dubs, no, AI dubs can never replace real dubs because the AI don't have the creativity. You can't always say the thing, but you can't come up with it. Well, we are going to see. No, and, yeah, on, yeah. That, and on that note... Never you say no, you can't. Listen, you, say, you have a thing. I, I know about dance hall culture. You have certain things in our culture where if an AI come up with it, it must be God. No, but me because I tell you, the same people. No, are because the, the words, the words we choose to use back at each other, it, no, in a, it is of no format. And remember, right. so everything in, in, in AI and technology goes off uh, data input and coding That's based correct. on a specific data language. Input. No, yes. based on a specific coding language. So if we're saying things that is not in the dictionary, the AI cannot repeat it or duplicate it. They'll catch up with us at some point. But I want us to thank our panelists. This has been very exciting. Great discussion. We are out of time. Thank you very much, everybody.